The hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such the Father seeks to worship him. Amen. Herb, could you please lead us in the confession of sin? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and in deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Father Tom, you got to come off mute. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, come, let us adore him. Psalm today is Psalm number 123. To you I lift up my eyes. To you enthroned in the heavens. As the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their masters. And the eyes, eyes of a maid to the hand of a mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God. Until he shows us his mercy. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy. For we have had more than enough of contempt. Too much of the scorn of the indolent rich. And of the derision of the proud. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Ezekiel. The Lord said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gretchen, could you please lead us in Canticle 19, the Song of the Redeemed? O oh, ruler of the universe, Lord God, great deeds are they that you have done, surpassing human understanding. Your ways are ways of righteousness and truth, O king of all ages. Who can fail to do you homage, Lord, and sing the praises of your name? For you only are the Holy One. All nations will draw near and fall down before you because your just and holy works have been revealed. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in body or out of body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up in paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, 
to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would lead me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with my weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake, for sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Jesus came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their own town and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick, and cured them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning's gospel begins with the statement that Jesus came to his hometown, Nazareth. Of course, we know that he was born in a little town, Bethlehem, and that throughout his earthly life, his eyes were set towards Jerusalem. Major locations along his way, even if they didn't give a hoot about him in Nazareth. Moses receives the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And where is Mount Sinai? Well, find Jordan and then northwest Saudi Arabia near the Red Sea coast, and then you find Mount Sinai. Where was the burning bush? Somewhere there. But is the significance of the burning bush its location itself or what happened there? My point is, it seems there's always a story attached that expresses why a place is holy, right? So if you were to sketch a map of your faith journey, what places along the way would you mark as the locations? of sacred moments in your life, your life-shaping moments, places that locate times and events that marked you, perhaps changing you or reminding you about the way things are, where you have seen something of God or God has seen you. I'm going to share three such places for me. They are Davis Park, Delphi, and Ismic. Davis Park is on Fire Island, but before I take the ferry there, I was reminded about how in my early life, my early childhood, my parish church in Ronkonkoma was a very standard, traditional, somewhat dark interior, darkened all the more by the stained glasses, the statues, and we'd arrive there in our Sunday best. But also in my early childhood, in fact, from my toddler years until I went off to college, my parents ran a resort on Fire Island at 
Davis Park. Now, one of the structures that was quite prominent there and in my memory was called the casino, the Legia Beach Casino, which had a huge bar and a dance floor and big wide open windows looking at the ocean. Throughout most of the week, that bar smelled like stale, stale beer and other spilled libations. The floors were a little bit sticky and sandy. But on Saturday nights become Sunday mornings around 2 a.m. closings, all the bartenders and workers scrubbed and mopped the floor clean, made the bar shine. And by Sunday morning at 10 o'clock when people gathered, there was a kind of incense smell known as pine saw. That the body and blood of Christ could transform a bar into a church on Sunday morning made quite an impression on this five becoming six-year-old. Eventually, in the early 60s, a parish church was finally built in Davis Park. Architecturally, it looked just like an upside-down boat, and it meant to be that way, beached between the bay and the ocean. Everything about it was sand-colored, the wood floors, the chairs. There were clear floor to ceiling angled side windows showing sand and sky and bay. Nothing like the church I had been growing up in up until that point. T-shirt, shorts, bare feet at Sunday liturgies. For that little child, God was so present in the simplicity and comfort of a summer day and people so present to God in their everydayness. The second place I'll share with you is Delphi. Yes, the Oracle of Delphi. It had been for centuries and centuries a, a sacred place, and around 7 BC, it got the name the Oracle of Delphi at the sanctuary of Apollo above the Corinthian Gulf in Greece, high up on the slopes of Mount Parnassus. Standing there, the mountains were so high up, you had to bend backwards to see up. And you felt as though the mountains would become waves and crash down upon you. You, you just can't see all the way up. And when you look down into the ravine and you lean forward at the expanse that just keeps going down, you feel like you're going to go down too. The ancients heard oracles here. I felt the immensity, the awesome, overpowering realization that there's so much I do not know. There's so much more than me. Not that I am a speck, but that in this place, I knew that my place on this planet, in this universe, is not knowable by me. There is a power that cannot even begin to be explained. The third location, Iznik, in modern day Turkey. But during the times when it was known as Asia Minor, Iznik was known as the city of Nicaea, the site of the first Nicene Council called by Emperor Constantine, a convention or council of over 300 bishops in the year 325 to settle a controversy about Christ because of the Arian heresy that Jesus was a creation neither human nor divine. It was settled there in Nicaea, Jesus Christ fully human, fully divine, and the co-equal nature of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, the foundation of the Nicene Creed, the bedrock of Christian faith. I was with 30 clergy going to this magnificent site. We pull into Iznik, and the big motor coach bus parks right next to a grassy park, a bit of a knoll, and we figured the bus was stopping there because it couldn't get any closer to where the church was. 
So we get out of the bus and we start walking, but we actually walk right up onto this grass that we're parked next to. And as we move further into that park, we approach this big crater. And there's a ladder. We have to climb down into an excavated site. And as we descend, we realize that this crater is all, not all that big and that the walls of the church are what surround us when we reach the bottom of the hole. This hole, with, yes, some remaining bricked parts of walls, the site of the Nicene Council, over 300 bishops gathering in a space only slightly bigger than the All Souls footprint. How did 300 bishops fit in that space, invisible now to the world? As I climb up from the ladder about an hour later, I just realized that big things can happen in little spaces. Those are my three, three places that I would share with you. And I don't mean that to set the stage for what any places in your journey have been like, but if anyone would like to share a place that's a marker in your in your journey, please do so now. I have one. Okay, sir. The Invisible Zoo. Um, okay. the first, the very first one was a quick one. Was the first time I ever saw the Sistine Chapel, and I looked up and I saw that ceiling, and my very first thought in my head was, "There's no way any man on earth did this without God." So that was the first one. The second one was when <laughs> Dan and I went to Israel and we walked the Via Della Rosa. And I kept having the strangest thought pressing in on me, which is pretty dopey in, re in retrospect. And the thought was, it really did happen. It really did happen. And there was a spot where you go underneath, underground to where the, where the cross was in, in the ground above. And there was a rock there that was split in two and the rock had two different colors. And then they explained that was Jesus's blood that dripped down from the cross. And the rock is split in two because there was an earthquake. And again, that phrase kept coming into my brain. It really happened. It really happened. Of course it did. That's what I got. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else invisible or visible? I can tell you that there was um, a time when I was a very little girl, young girl, like maybe eight or nine, and I used to go to the St. James Lutheran Church in St. James, and that's where I started my faith journey and happened to have a wonderful pastor there who was very supportive of uh, families and young children, and I had to, <clears throat> during Sunday school, they asked us to write a little blurb of something that we thought was important in our lives and uh, to write a little poem. And they asked us, they were supposed to be said in church and there was some kind of miscommunication. And I know I was very disappointed because I had gone home and worked very hard on the poem and it wasn't going to be read. And when I went to church, the pastor actually read a portion of my poem during his sermon. And I remember feeling like I don't want to say validated, but important. And I think what you said about people being small things, big things happening in small places, I think big things can happen with small children too. And that's why it's so important that we acknowledge and include them, even though sometimes it's not easy. So, Good story. And thank you for sharing it right from the heart of your life. Anyone else? Tell one more recently, um, Sue has a special devotion to the um, Mother Mary, as you know, and she leads the rosary and 
a couple of years ago for Christmas, it's always a question of what do you get your wife for Christmas? You know, a woman who has everything. So I got her a Virgin Mary statue and I left it in the, um, in the living room by the Christmas tree. And I think it scared her. I think she, maybe she saw that, you know, there was an apparition. Um, but uh, later on, I put that Virgin Mary in the garden and in front of our house. And uh, I recently painted it white. I have to paint it every couple of years. And I came home the other day and there was an Hispanic woman with her arms around the statue of the Virgin Mary, obviously in prayer. Uh, and, you know, what do you do? You know, I just said what I decided. Sometimes the best thing to do is just nothing. And it occurred to me that that spot had become, in my front yard, had become a very holy place to this, this woman and her devotion to the Virgin Mary. Nice. Thank you. You know, I'll try to keep up with the group here. Um, and I, I'll do three, too. Uh, okay. But I, I I always think of my grandmother's house, which always welcomed us. Um, you know, it, it, she was a person of faith, but there was never any judgment of the rebunctious, disobedient, uh, uh, wild children that she kept for a couple of weeks at a time um, with our husband, my grandfather, and. Um, there, there were no reprimands and there was just a, just an acceptance and uh, uh, it really made a difference. I also, um, the second place is the ocean or water, which I always reflect on when it comes in, the tide comes in and washes away. I think that's uh, symbolic of a lot of things in our life that um, are allowed to be um, forgiven and removed and uh, give us a new beginning. Uh, which we always need. And then the other more physical one is when we visited Istanbul, I just felt um, there's a certain, uh, a, a, a certain draw in which you see the three faiths in harmony there today and an acceptance that there is a higher spiritual power that uh, makes everyone brothers and sisters. Just my ideas. Good. Thank you, Herb. Thank you. All right. I won't I won't belabor the silence because it's rich with everything that's been said. And I thank you for sharing it this morning. And we'll go back to the efficient and continue with morning prayer. Charlie, could you please lead us in the Apostles' Creed? No, Charlie. Charlie, you have to put your mic on. Give him a second. Okay. Uh, Sue, could you lead us in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sue, could you also help with the prayers? Yes. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray in the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Tammy, if you could please help with the suffrages. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. 
Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day, we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. And we shall never hope in vain. Let us pray. Oh, oh God, you have taught us to keep all your commandments by loving you and our neighbor. Grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit that we may be devoted to you with our whole heart and united to one another with pure affection through Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray for the sick and the suffering. Heavenly Father, giver of life and health, comfort and relieve your sick servants. We pray especially today for Hanita Alexander, Lucy Cardamone, Mark Gaeta, Ashley Emerson and Hudson Mize Gaeta, Michael Guthrie, Trudy Roman, Lorette Reachin, Beth Whiteside, and Helena, are there others? I ask your prayers for Rob Lane, who's in the hospital. Jill, Stephanie, and Joanne. Lord, we ask that you give your power of healing to those that minister to their needs, that they may be strengthened in their weakness and have confidence in your loving care through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we prepare to say the prayer for mission, we pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Sean, our, pres our, our presiding bishop-elect, for Lawrence, our diocesan bishop, for all bishops, for Tom, our vicar, and for all other ministers. We also pray under the Anglican cycle of prayer for the Church uh, of the Province of the Indian Ocean. John, could you please uh, lead us in the uh, prayer for mission? Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry, they may truly and devoutly serve you through Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Special intentions today, we give thanks for our wardens and the Bishop's Committee as they discern a way forward in securing pastoral ministry leadership for All Souls Church, for Father Ian Wetmore, who is considering a call to be our priest in charge, and for the people of St. James Church, who, like us, are praying about the shared clergy model going forward. We also uh, give thanks for Father Tom, who will be celebrating a birthday this week. I believe he's going to turn 39. Are there any other uh, special intentions? I ask for prayers for uh, uh, Mike and Ronnie Oliva, whose daughter Emerson Isabella will be baptized next Sunday. Thank you. For all the blessings God has put upon this nation this week of our independence celebration. We give thanks for our musicians, our poets, and Native American drumming. Um, we did the special concert where we combined all three last night, and it was a wonderful, reflective, spiritual experience for all. And Father Ian was, was actually with us, read the prayer from Saint, of St. Saint Francis. Any other special requests? Okay. Herb, could you please lead us in the general thanksgiving? Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness and to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. For the means of grace and for the hope of glory, and we pray, give us such awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, Lord, 
our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen.